Welcome everyone to the District 33 House of Representatives Virtual Town Hall. My name is Malcolm Chapman and I've partnered with Elevate Rapid City to be the moderator of this event. We are excited you chose to be a part of this afternoon session as we invite local legislative candidates to share their platform, their ideas, and their story. In these uncertain times, public meetings and traditional campaign events are difficult to facilitate. So we hope that this webinar can help serve as the public's opportunity to hear from candidates themselves. Today, we have joining us in the race for District 33 State House of Representatives is Melanie Torno, a Republican running for District 33 House. Phil Jensen and Taffy Howard are the other two candidates running for this seat, but they are not joining us this afternoon. As a reminder, these three candidates face a Republican primary election on the 2nd of June. Just let me start off by saying, I hope that everyone and your family and your friends and your circle are being safe and healthy during these uncertain times. Just a little bit about myself. I am originally from Chicago, a longtime Rapid City resident, a former city council member here in Rapid City and a former Marine enlisted and Marine officer. I travel the country generally uh, doing public speaking and facilitating and moderating and hosting meetings, but enough about me. I would like to set the stage for today's town hall. We are first going to introduce Melanie uh, and she'll have five minutes to introduce herself. As uh, she is introducing herself, I would just recommend that you as the audience are encouraged to submit questions through the question and answer feature found on your screen. Once her introduction is finished, I will begin to share questions that are received from the audience through the Q&A feature. Melanie will then have two minutes to answer the question. We have the ability to export all questions that are submitted through the Q&A. So if your specific question is not read aloud today, we will encourage Melanie to reach out after the webinar and address your question directly. We will do our best to ask and have Melanie answer as many questions as the time limit allows. We will conclude once the stream of audience questions expires or we reach the time limit. There are two questions that we sent Melanie ahead of time to prepare, and I will cover these topics if they're not prompted by one of the audience questions. We will conclude promptly at four to be respectful of everyone's schedule, but we may conclude a little earlier seeing that we only have one candidate online with us today. Finally, I want to set a few guidelines. Just as a reminder, only questions received through the Q&A feature will be submitted to me to ask the candidate. We will not address questions sent through the chat feature. As the moderator, I will strictly enforce the time limits and I will hold up a red card when 30 seconds are remaining in the question. After two minutes, the candidate will be muted so that we can move on to the next question. Most importantly, we will ask you to treat Melanie and other webinar attendees with respect. If you abuse the Zoom chat feature in an inappropriate or derogatory manner, we reserve the right to dismiss you from the webinar. And with that, let's get started. Melanie, you can start off with your introduction and you have five minutes. Okay, well, thank you, Malcolm. And thank you for um, to Elevate for hosting this event. And thank you for everybody that has joined us today. Um, I'm saddened to hear that um, Taffy Howard and Phil Jensen won't be joining us. Um, but so let me just get right to it and introduce myself. My name is Melanie Torno and I am a homegrown South Dakota girl. I have grown up in South Dakota since I was about two years old. My um, family came here to South Dakota because my parents were involved in the railroad. So we actually lived in Edgemont for a very long time until I was in middle school. And then we moved up to Rapid City and I am a, South Dakota, or a Central High School graduate. And then from there, um, I left for about a year and a half and tried college in different places. I went to Iowa and then ended up back here in South Dakota. And um, I knew education would be important. At that time, I had two children and I wanted a better future for them. And, and I figured the way to do that was to get my degree. So I received my bachelor's degree from Black Hill State University and I have a double major in psychology and human services. And then I took about a year off and, and tried to figure out exactly what I wanted to do and found that I needed a master's degree to do what I wanted to do. So I attended SDSU here in the um, Rapid City 
um, at that time we had the classroom building in um, the School of Mines campus. And so I graduated from SDSU with my master's in counseling. And then um, a little bit about after I, so when I graduated with S from SDSU, I graduated with my counseling for school counseling as well as in an agency. I had small children at the time, working in a school was was great, it had, you know, holidays off, school hours. Um, it was just very conducive to having um, to having children. So I did that for about six years um, at Douglas School District. And two years prior to that, I had worked at Knollwood and, and Horseman Elementary. And I did family counseling in both places. Um, I knew I always wanted to be in my own business. And so um, after eight years of being in the school, I took the leap and I started my own private practice. And I've been in private practice as a mental health therapist for about, um, almost eight years, not quite eight years, so just shy of eight. Um, and so I've been doing that. And along the way, I've been mentoring other therapists, um, providing supervision for them to um, get their licenses as well. Um, recently, my husband and I decided we want to venture into owning commercial property. So the day the national emergency was declared, we actually signed our papers for our commercial office building. So it's been an adventure in the, for the last six weeks on that. Um, so we are looking at turning uh, something that could be handed to us as lemons, we're turning into lemonade. And we're actually looking at within the next six months, hiring four to six people. So to grow that um, as an agency and then have more people come and provide mental health services in an agency format. Um, I am married. My husband is Gerard. We've been married for um, 10 years, 10 and a half years, and um, tomorrow is actually our 11 year dating anniversary, if anyone still does that. Um, when we got married, I had two children and he had one, and they were um, six, eight, and 10 when we got married, and they are all grown and out of the house. We actually thought we would be um, empty nesters by now, but God laughed and said, well, we're gonna give you some more children. So we actually have a seven and a nine year old as well. And um, so they are here um, somewhere at home, um, occupying themselves, hopefully doing schoolwork, but I'm sure that's doubtful at this time of day. Um, uh, I actually have three grandchildren as well. My oldest daughter is married. Her husband is security forces in the Air Force and they are stationed here at Ellsworth and they have three children. Um, like I said, I am a small business owner and um, I know that the effects of COVID has had on small businesses, the uncertainty of knowing what are we gonna do with our business or um, how can we in the long run uh, stay in our business. I've been very passionate about economic development here in Rapid City. So two years ago, I actually brought 1 million cups here, which we meet weekly. Right now it's um, virtual, but uh, we meet weekly and we build a network of entrepreneurs to, um, talk about our successes, our struggles, and then be able to build relationships so we can continue to grow our businesses as well as other people's businesses. Um, so I'm very passionate about economic development. That is one of my platform issues um, with the B21s coming here as well. It's very important for us to be on board and ready for all of the influx of the people. I've had lots of um, meetings regarding housing and ha finding affordable housing here because that's the American dream is everybody to be able to come here, purchase their own home, raise their families in it. Um, and so I've been talking to some like Black Hills home builders about how we can do that. Melanie, thank you for that introduction. Uh, you started to launch in on small businesses. So our first question is, what can South Dakota do to encourage and support more small businesses in the area? And you'll have two minutes and at 30, with 30 seconds left, I'll hold up a red card. Sorry, I didn't understand the red card. So now I do, good, thank you. Um, so what can we do to help continue to grow small businesses? The first thing we can do is support local. If you um, want to purchase some kind of, um, you know, 
I guess, birthday gift, go to your local toy store from that is owned by a local uh, merchant here in town. Um, go to the restaurants that are owned that are the small, you know, mom and pa shops. Um, go and support those people. Those are the people that, you know, usually have strong South Dakota roots and we need to continue to support them. The other thing is, is um, what I have done is I've met with entrepreneurs, um, like with One Million Cups. I help them to develop uh, business plans to help them sustain for longer periods of time, help them look outside of the box so that they can continue to grow their business and shift with whatever changes are going on. Um, I did that as soon as COVID started hitting, I had some small meeting Zooms. Um, we spoke about what can each specific business do to shift a little bit and still be in business. And if they're not having, being able to provide their services or have sales right now, what they can do to be relevant in the long term. Um, I was talking about the housing. That's also very important. We need to be able to um, support our builders. Uh, we're going to have a huge influx when the B21s come here, and so we're going to need more affordable housing. So, so being able to support um, the housing industry as well, and all of those businesses create a huge tax revenue for us. So then that way it'll help to support the things that services that we need, like education. Thank you, Melanie. Our second question is regarding the COVID nineteen pandemic. As a state legislator. What role will you take in leading the Rapid City and larger South Dakota community through a period of repair and regrowth from the effects of the pandemic, economic development, public health, and state policy? Okay, well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I've thought a lot about this uh, more on a mental health perspective we have had to shift the types of services or the methods of our services that we provide. And it's been um, very interesting as a provider to have to shift in a very quick fashion and then still be able to reach people. Um, so for me, the mental health piece has been the thing that's been the most on my heart. And, and this is where we need to be creative and make sure we have enough providers to provide the services that are needed. And then also uh, different methods, whether it's telehealth. Um, this just opened up my eyes on, in South Dakota, we have a huge rural population. And so there are some people that may not be able to drive 150 miles each direction to be able to get mental health services. So let's create some different um, creative options to be able to do those types of things. The second thing is, um, you know, we need to, and we've all talked about the CARES Act and PPP, and, and this is where we really need to support local and look at is there, you know, less regulation that we can do to help um, like the home builders or different agencies, retail um, merchants to be able to quickly recoup some of their lo uh, losses that they've had over the last six weeks. And so that would be my two primary focuses. Thank you, Melanie. The next question is, what would you prioritize in the state budget so that South Dakota can rebuild from the COVID crisis and why? Oh, state budget. Um, wow, there's a lot of things that I would um, prioritize. Um, Obviously, you know, there was a huge question going into this regarding education and, and um, the pay for state employees that obviously needs to be looked at um, going into this that we thought that we had more income than we had and um, well, it projected anyway, and then there was no way to anticipate COVID and the effects that we would have. So definitely taking a look at um, how can we still make sure we have that percentage that we had anticipated and if not then what adjustments do we need to make moving forward so um i guess regarding the budget is making sure that we have all the funds that we need to cover the the bare minimum and if we need to then find some places that we could cut that would be not um, as detrimental as some of the other areas and so that's what i would do Thank you, Melanie. Um, just along that same vein, do you have additional thoughts on addressing the anticipated budget deficit caused by the lack of sales tax revenue due to COVID? Oh, that was a great question. Um, you know, I don't have the answer solely by myself. And the thing that I would do as a state legislature would be 
collaborate with other people. Um, this is not a one person show. This is really where you have to collaborate, have communication, um, see everybody's viewpoints and take a look at what can we do and how can we get back to a balanced budget without having a huge deficit? Are there things that we could cut that wouldn't hurt us in this fiscal year and maybe add back in, say the next fiscal year when our tax revenue has increased? Thank you. What do you see as the best process to stabilize the big three in the state budget and still support all the other needs in the state? And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the big three refer to teacher pay, Medicare and Medicaid services, and state employee pay. And I can read that again if you'd like, Melanie. Yes, please do. So the question was, what do you see as the best process to stabilize the big three in the state budget and still support all other needs in the state. And again, the big three are teacher pay, Medicare and Medicaid services, and then state employee pay. Well, the best thing that we can do to make sure our budget is where it needs to be is to increase our tax revenue without creating more taxes. So this is where we can help support the small businesses, um, ask people to shop local. So it's creating the tax revenues that stay in our area and our state. Um, and like I said, from the last question, I don't have the magic answer. Um, it's, not a, it's not a one person answer. This is a many person's answer. And we need to have all the different perceptions and collaborate together. And this is where having good communication and good listening skills is gonna be very helpful because we need to be able to reach out to other people and see their perspective and, and look outside of the box of, of what can we do to make sure we have the funds for the bare minimum. And like I said in the, in the last question, maybe cut some things that we can add back in in the next fiscal year. Thank you. So if elected, uh, what will you will your funding priorities be for 21-22 timeframe? And specifically, how will you approach funding for K-12 education? Oh, good question. Um, lots of funding questions. OK. Um, well, there are two things that are um, Two of the platform issues that I have is mental health and education, and they both have um, a play in the funding. Now, I do. I believe in having balanced budgets. I believe being fiscally responsible. Um, I believe we need to take a look at what can we do to make whatever funding that we have for our budget and make it be. Um, makes sense. So instead of going into the deficit, let's try to make sure that we're um, balanced, but still providing the services that we need. Are there some, especially for like mental health, are there some services or are there some providers that um, could be credentialed or could be providing more mental health services? And, um, and then that way, it's not costing as much money into the budget. Um, K-12 education is always a big passion of mine. Um, and this is, again, it goes into we need to stimulate our economy again, and we need to continue to buy here in South Dakota and support our um, retailers and our restaurants and our mom pa shops and make sure that we're keeping that tax revenue here instead of in different areas. And then that way, with the, with the tax revenue, we have more funding to be able to fund the things that we want, the education, mental health, um, and make sure everything is balanced, but um, funded appropriately. Thank you. Our next question is, what are your thoughts on taxes on businesses? Should they be higher? lower or different? Well, thank you for that question. Um, there's lots of different tax for different businesses. Um, you know, at the, at the current time, um, you know, be, be, going into peer in January, I will be a freshman legislator. And this is where, um, this is also a time to really understand and dig into the budget, understand the tax, um, the taxes um, where they're at, and um, then make decisions. I think going into it would be premature on my end. Um, I don't 
want to increase taxes as a, you know, a fiscal conservative, raising taxes is, is not really an option. And so just going into it and learning more about it and seeing if there are other things that, that we can do. I mean, the goal is always to lower taxes. Uh, and if we can do that, great. And if we can't, let's at least make sure that we're not going to raise them. Thank you. Our next question is, without going into confidential information, can you share the largest needs of the mental health community in this region? Oh my. Um, I, um, I um, for myself, I actually specialize in trauma and I specialize in blended families. So that's primarily my focus. Um, what I see as a huge need is, um, and it's because of the line of work that, that I personally do, I feel like the, the biggest focus needs to be on the trauma piece. Um, you know, whether it's, um, I focus a lot on sexual assault um, from young children as adults. And so for me, that would be what I feel like is the biggest need. It impacts everything. It, it impacts their um, mood stability. It impacts their thought processes, their abilities to hold jobs. Um, it can lead into addictions. Um, it can lead into a huge amount of other mental health issues. And I feel like if we can reach those people while they're younger um, or closer to when the trauma has happened, then it can help not have 20 years that you're waiting to get some kind of a service and then impact all these other areas of your life. Now, if I have someone that comes to me that has other types of mental health issues that I may not primarily focus on, then I will refer them to therapists that do. And then that way they can receive the best services. So for me, it's not about the amount of clients. It's about providing the best possible services to the individual, whether it's from myself or somebody else. Thank you. Other than budget items, what laws or issues would you modify, remove, or view as what is needed? Okay. Um, well, I don't have, at this point, I don't have any specific laws I would like to go straight in and change or modify, um, revise, or add, take away. Um, you know, I, I do know that what's important is listening to the constituents. And I think as the time gets closer to coming to peer, you need to start listening to the constituents and what their issues are. And those are the things that need to be brought forward. I feel like I could bring my own personal um, agendas there, but I'm choosing not to because it's not about the Melanie, um, the Melanie laws. It's about the District 33 or the state laws that I feel like is the most important. So for me, I would take the time to listen to the constituents and be able to bring forward their concerns, not just my concerns. Thank you. What was your biggest motivator behind wanting to serve in the South Dakota legislature? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, for those of you that know me well, I am usually not the poster child. Driving down the street, seeing my picture on a sign is very uncomfortable for me. Um, I am really a behind the scenes person in most, most cases. Um, two years ago, I was in Leadership South Dakota, and that was in 2018. And um, we were on a bus one day through driving through Mitchell, and one of my classmates said, you need to run. And I said, no, I'm a, I'm a behind the scenes person. Like I can, I, I can see myself being a lobbyist or helping, you know, prepare bills or things like that. And they're like, no, you have the voice, you need to run. And so, um, um, you know, it's just kind of stewed a little bit and I've prayed about it. My husband's prayed about it. We've talked uh, to our children about it. And I always have had a heart to serve and wanting to give back. So um, I've always done that in my community and my church and my family. And this was just the next step for me. We, I mean, I prayed about it and I really felt led that, that um, this was what I needed to do, that this was my next step to give back. Thank you. Our next question is, where do you stand on some of the more controversial social issues like LGBTQ issues, abortion rights, and Medicaid expansion, and et cetera? Oh, so I get a whole list all at once. Okay. Um, you know, as a, as a conservative Republican, 
You know, uh, this is a this is kind of a, uh, one of those questions that you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, I have personal views on you know um, same sex marriage. I have personal views on um, you know some of the controversial social issues. However, the thing is, is I also believe that we need to focus on things that are going to impact the whole entire state, not just necessarily the social issue issues. Um, a lot of the things that I have concerns about with the social issues is a lot of times we have these outside groups that are trying to come into South Dakota because we're a conservative state and make a point here. And then in the long run, what tends to happen is it ends up costing our taxpayers money because we're fighting it out in court. And I don't feel like that's a good use of our time or our money. Um, you know, I, as a therapist, I treat everybody the same. I have had um, um, couples that have been female same-sex couples, male same-sex couples, and then um, opposite gender couples. To me, it doesn't matter um, on um, providing services to them. Now, um, I do have personal views on them. If they ever asked me about them, I would share them, but I've never been asked them. And I just treat everybody as a person. And, and the real thing is, is I wanna get down to what can we do to help South Dakota as a whole, not necessarily on the social issues that's going to impact a handful of people. Let's look at the, let's look at the big issues. Um, economic development, education, mental health, those are huge issues in our state. And, um, and we need to be able to focus on those types of things as well as our infrastructure as well. Thank you for that answer. How would you communicate with your constituents to gather feedback? There seems to be a lot of apathy behind local state politics. Any ideas to engage and change that? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I have listed on everything that I have. I've listed all of my social media platforms. Um, I'm actually very transparent. <clears throat> Any survey and questionnaire I've been sent, I've actually posted on there so people know where, where I stand. I've had people call me, I've had people email me and I've responded. Um, the other thing I think is very important is to continue to touch base with your constituents, whether it's a Zoom meeting or you know, a quarterly or every two months or whatever the time frame is, have some kind of social event, uh, a coffee or um, some kind of get together where if constituents are concerned, they can come and bring them to you. I mean, Cracker Barrels are great, but it's not as a whole panel. And sometimes it's also limited. You don't get to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So um, if I'm elected, then those are the things that I will implement. I want to be available to constituents of District 33 and listen to their current concerns and then be able to bring that into peer. What differences are there between you and the other candidates for District 33 House, and what do you have to offer that they have not demonstrated in their time in peer? Um, well, first and foremost, mental health is a huge issue. Uh, I'm a mental health therapist, and I'm on the front lines. I also have a background in education, and I understand the needs of the families. I understand the needs of the school, um, and I also understand the needs of being a parent. Um, so with the mental health issue and, and things that we see in our education system, we need to have somebody who understands all of those and can also be an advocate for those that don't have the voice in, in peer. Um, and so, and the other thing is that that's different is I show up. Um, everything that I've, I've ever committed to, I've always shown up, I've given 120%. Um, so I, I will, I pledge that I will show up. I will make things happen. Um, I may not always vote the way that you want to, but I, I will definitely have a conversation with you about why I voted a certain way. I, I also pledge that I will be willing to listen to any concerns from any constituents. So um, I will be available and I will show up and I will advocate for the constituents of District 33. Thank you, Melanie. Our next audience question is, I have heard said that the next pandemic will be a mental or psychological pandemic. What are your feelings on this prediction and how will the mental health community deal with this? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think we're already seeing a smaller version of that. Um, 
it's not very often talked about, but when people have been, um, if you if you look at the news, there's an increase in child abuse right now. There's an increase in spousal abuse. So we have all of these um, extra stresses that are caused by the finances, not being able to get out of our house safely, or in some in some cases, people feel that absolute fear that they're terrified to even be able to do anything that's activating people's fight or flight responses or freeze responses. And then they're choosing to uh, make poor choices. As a mental health professional, I think we need to watch the trends and I think we need, also need to be on the front lines and we need to make services more accessible to people. We should not be having barriers. If somebody has a mental health issue, we need to be able to get them the correct services with the correct providers. And that's ensuring that our providers are credentialed correctly, that they're um, licensed correctly, and that um, they are qualified to be able to perform the services that they are. We also need to take a look at, uh, for myself personally, when I chose um, to purchase my a commercial office building, I made sure it was on the bus route. So just in case there was any concerns, then I would be accessible, um, you know, and, I, and um, we need to increase the accessibility of um, emergency care as well for mental health. And I know with we have the crisis care center here on, on West River, but sometimes that's not always enough services. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at all of them. Same thing as, um, as well as on, on the criminal justice, as in the jails and prisons and things like that, we also need to take a look at: can we um, can we rehabilitate them? Is there an underlying mental health issue or an addiction issue? And look at that so we can end up with more productive citizens, and um, and, and then in the long run, that helps everybody. Ellen, thank you. We have exhausted the questions that have come in from the audience. We'll give them just a, a few more seconds in case they want to ask another question to submit through the uh, Q&A feature. Um, but if we don't have a question, we're going to start to move toward our close. Okay. So we'll just give that 30 seconds. Melanie, thank you. Just by the nature of you being the only one here today, you've answered more questions than previous uh, uh, participants. So thank you for that. Um, so we'll move to a time to close now. And here's um, a minute for you to have a closing comment. So um, at 30 seconds, I'll actually put up the, uh, the sign. So you have one minute to just have a closing statement. Well, thank you to Elevate again for hosting this event. And thank you for everybody that's participating. Um, we have an opportunity here in District 33 to make some big changes. We have an open house seat and um, I think it's time that we have some change. We need some leaders that are going to show up for things and to be able to get some things done. I pledge to focus on mental health and economic development as well as education. Um, those are my priority issues. However, I, going to peer, I do not want it to be all about Melanie. I want it to be about the constituents. I pledge that I will um, have conversations, um, Zoom meetings, in-person meetings to continue to get the concerns of the constituents of District 33 and bring them to peer. Um, you know, I have a solid background with education and um, I, I have a strong voice and I'm not afraid to advocate for what I feel is best for the state. And so I would humbly ask for your vote and support on June 2nd. Melanie, thank you. And on behalf of myself and Elevate Rapid City, we thank you, the audience, for the time you spent with Melanie today. And we'd like to thank um, Melanie for participating. Um, we are very grateful to you, Melanie, for participating and sharing your perspective with us today. If you have any questions about voting or the elections, please reach out to Elevate. Melanie is one of three candidates who will face a primary election on district for District 33 coming in June 2nd. We're going to take a short break and we'll begin the next session for District 33 Senate candidates promptly at 415. 
you will need to find the separate registration link for the Senate candidate. So refer back to your email inbox, your, your email chat box, I'm sorry. And we've posted that there as well. So thank you all, be safe and have a good afternoon.